Hello, my name is James Robson, and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. The Asia Center's author conversation series is aimed at highlighting insightful engagements with authors of books published recently by the Asia Center Publications Program and other publishers on topics of interest to the Asia Center's mission of fostering research on Asia in transnational and transregional perspectives. We very much hope you enjoy the conversations. Hello, my name is James Robson and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. And I'd like to welcome you this evening to uh, the next in our series of the Asia Center's Author Conversation Series. And today I'm joined by Professor Ho Li, who is a professor in urban planning in the College of Architecture and Urban Planning at Tongji University in Shanghai, China. And she actually has very deep connections uh, to Harvard University, uh, where she, after receiving her Master of Engineering in Urban Planning from Tongji University, uh, she came and received her Master of Design Studies in 2005 from the Graduate School of Design, and then also received her Doctor of Design in 2009. Uh, from Harvard University. And uh, she then again returned in uh, 2014 and 20 to 2015 as a coordinate research scholar at the Harvard Yenjing Institute, uh, working with Professor Peter Rowe of the Graduate School of Design. And Holdi's scholarship addresses the history of urban planning in modern China with a particular attention to the relationship of industrialization and urbanization the development of urban planning as a discipline, and as well as the urban-rural relationship. From 2012 to 2013, uh, Professor Holy served as the Vice Director for Development and Reform Commission of the Hong Kong District Government in, of the Shanghai Municipality, and she's also been an expert member of the Shanghai Municipal uh, Planning Commission uh, since 2012, and a member of the China Woman Planners Society. In addition to the book that we'll be discussing uh, today, she has also written on the work of the very interesting uh, Richard Pollack, uh, who spent uh, 1933 to 1949 in Shanghai and has written a work entitled Richard Pollack in Shanghai, 1933 to 1949, uh, The Postwar Planning and Reconstruction of a Modern Chinese Metropolis, published by uh, Tongji University Press in 2016. Her second book, and the book that we'll be discussing today, uh, is entitled Building for Oil, Dodging and the Formation of the Chinese Socialist State. And this was published by uh, the Harvard University Asia Center in 2018. And it was also uh, awarded a first prize for the most innovative book in planning history written in English by the International Planning History Society, uh, which endeavors to foster the study of planning history worldwide. And it seeks to advance scholarship in the fields of urbanism, history, planning and the environment and focusing particularly on cities from the late 19th century. So I'd like to welcome Professor Ho Li, and I wish that we were able to meet in person uh, and welcome you back to Harvard uh, yet again, uh, but we're forced to do it, uh, the interview on Zoom this way. Um, but in fact, uh, doing it, uh, the interview uh, virtually like this, in a sense is, is appropriate for this week. I don't know if you know, but it, this is actually just the beginning of uh, what's called Harvard Worldwide Week, um, which is a week set aside uh, to showcase the remarkable uh, breadth of Harvard's global engagement. And there are a number of activities that are going on. So it just happens that it falls at that time. But in any case, we're very glad you could join us today. So. Thank you. Thank you, James. And thank you, uh, Professor Robson, for the nice uh, introduction and uh, hello uh, to all uh, our potential audience uh, <laughs> yeah. of this uh, video. Uh, um, this is a great honor for, for me to, he, uh, to be here to introduce uh, my book and to talk about that uh, with Professor Robson. Uh, and uh, yeah. Okay. Well, good. Is, so that's uh, a... uh, yeah, uh, I think one, one more thing is uh, I'm now uh, in Shanghai. It's a uh, beautiful morning uh, during the National Day uh, holiday to give uh, mm. this a little bit global contact when we cannot travel that much. Exactly. So it's a, it, it is a, a, an odd time to be doing things like this, but it also opens some opportunities where we can, uh, we probably couldn't have actually had you come quickly to, uh, to come back to Harvard just to do this, but uh, we can do it uh, in the, this format. So, so I'd like to start actually with your, um, with a, a very general question about your work of 
um, building for oil, which really struck me as an incredibly ambitious and innovative work. Uh, and it touched on a real wide range of significant topics uh, that include issues of industrialization, um, obviously the formation of the main city that you study Daching um, as a model of a socialist state. So it also uh, is connected with uh, political developments, but also commodities, something like oil. And uh, so I was wondering, how did this book come into being for you as a choice of, of your research to focus on that, uh, that city and also this topic of, of uh, the development of the oil industry in China? I think the, the book, I, I see the, the book as uh, the topic as a seed uh, growing out of uh, my early Harvard years. Uh, it was at the time, uh, 2004, it uh, was for my second master degree. Uh, when I first enrolled in uh, at uh, Harvard University Graduate School of Design, uh, 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 after several years of practice in urban and regional planning uh, in Shanghai, I was uh, looking for a reorientation uh, in my academic life. Uh, I think the topic, uh, 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 first of all, was inspired by one of my supervisor's work, uh, Professor Margaret Crawford. At the time, she's uh, offering a, a course uh, on the history and the theory of urban interventions, uh, where I know her book, also based on her dissertation called Making the Working Man's Paradise, the Design mm. of uh, American Company Town. And also another work uh, by her mentor, indeed, that have large influence over me, uh, uh, Professor Doris Hayden at UC Berkeley called uh, The Power of a Place, uh, Urban Landscape uh, as Public History. Uh, and of course, I, 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 many courses I've taken and the books I've read uh, in, at Harvard have huge impact on me. For example, uh, Professor Elizabeth Perry, her work, um, uh, Chinese uh, Work Unit, that way and uh, the history of the Chinese uh, working class and the politics uh, from um, Peter Rowe, for example, uh, uh, he wrote numerous books about uh, the history of Chinese architecture and uh, urbanism. Uh, uh, why um, am I interested in comedy town? Uh, because I grew up in one. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in an oil field called Shengli, uh, means success. Uh, it's in Shandong province, uh, Yellow River Delta uh, region. So I, uh, I thought I would wrote uh, my, my hometown as the topic. I, I was looking for the topic uh, of my future doctoral uh, dissertation. I, I inspired that I'm truly interested in the history of a company town uh, in China. So I decided to, um, to pick my hometown I'm familiar with. So, uh, but then as I carried on, I wrote at first as a term paper. Uh, then I realized uh, there's a mm, national model, there's a da qing behind mm -hmm. it that where uh, my hometown followed upon that he, it has this twin city structure, you know, oil workers uh, and staff, they, work and live uh, in the West city and the municipality, the, you know, the native people, uh, they live in a new town in the East, totally independent from each other. Uh, this, uh, this special structure indeed uh, heavily influenced by Da Qing as well as the other industrial cities in China. And I found this um, amazing collection about Da Qing uh, from Harvard Yanqing Library. So I, I decided to turn my focus to, to Da Qing. That's how it started in the very mm. uh, beginning. Yeah. So it must, have been, it must have been quite fascinating for you as uh, growing up in a town like that and then to actually dig into its history and sort of understand the layers that were already there that led up to the kind of modern, eventually the modern city that it became that you probably watched growing up. Uh, and then you were away for a while again, and it's probably different now than it was then. So what was that like to, uh, to sort of go into the archives of a place you know, you thought you knew so well, um, uh, just from walking the streets and growing up there? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's for me, it's quite uh, self-centered, shall I say. Uh, because it's more like a, 
identity, you know, self identity searching project for mm -hmm. me. I try to understand uh, my parents' generation. I never really asked uh, when I was a child, like why the environment I grew up is so different. Mm. <laughs> it's neither mm -hmm. urban nor rural. And also, uh, when I went to college, I, I found uh, many of my classmates, uh, they seem to uh, coming from all different places. But in the end, uh, they we, we share a very similar background. Their parents all work in a remote area, a factory, a major state project, coal mines, uh, or uh, like a steel plant, all sorts of uh, like a similar industrial project. So it, this is like a, a collective memory I'm searching. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think this has become uh, really more and more fascinating, not about uh, research, research itself, but it's also uh, about um, me seeking for identity and uh, seeking for like a future directions. Uh, That's what made it, I think, such a fascinating read uh, as well, is that I was expecting, you know, to learn a lot about, say, urban planning or industrial design or these uh, kind of things. But um, what really struck me was it was a very personal way of writing. And I think that comes through. It's telling a whole other story along with that. Um, that also is the story of the coming to be of, of modern China in many ways as well. Um, even through this one site, I, I, it felt that way to me. Um, uh, not just, so it's your personal story, but it's also telling a kind of personal story about China itself, it felt like, and reflecting on the transformation uh, of China from the, say from the uh, late 40s, early 50s, all the way up to the present day. Um, so that that uh, is, you know, I think a, a, a a difficult thing to do, actually, to ta tackle a, a, what seems like a, um, a topic about oil industry and, you know, urban planning and things like that, uh, a very design-oriented thing, but then to tell something where people matter as much as the place and the industry. So how, if you don't mind, um, uh, I would love to know just a little bit about, so in addition, I mean, there must have been uh, compelling reasons for you also, uh, besides just the personal choice for uh, why dotching became a kind of a focus for this as well. I mean, it might be that it's a kind of lucky coincidence that you grew up there, but also it just happens to be an interesting place. Um, but, you know, you describe in the book as uh, that dotching was a remote um, uh, 1960s oil field, and but somehow it uh, asserted itself as a kind of central um, place for uh, for these stories that we've just been talking about for um, uh, uh, both for industry, but also for, for modern China. So how did it, how did Daqing become such a key site for uh, telling this story then? I think first of all, uh, yeah, for, for the audience who doesn't know Daqing, uh, Daqing uh, is uh, still the largest oil field uh, in mainland uh, China. It served uh, as a model, uh, and also uh, it's the mo it was the most profitable state-owned enterprise and the largest uh, source of uh, state revenues uh, for almost uh, three decades. So it's politically, economically, uh, really important for the Young People's Republic uh, of China. It uh, it's like uh, this microcosm. Uh, this, uh, of young socialist China at the time. Uh, it was also at the center of a debate regarding the national development strategies of urbanization and uh, industrialization. And uh, it shaped uh, the, the way of urban planning and architecture uh, design, in especially housing and uh, uh, urban, uh, the provision of uh, uh, public facilities, urban amenities. And uh, I think it's definitely uh, shaped the past that China uh, on its way searching for, for modernity, this, uh, uh, this uh, tension uh, between the state and the society, this mass mobilization, all of these are quite typical and also represented the challenges and the choices that the China made at the time. That's why 
uh, I think uh, this uh, is not only personal, but uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it is significant uh, as mm -hmm. meaningful as a research itself. Um, and did you, I mean, I think one of the challenges, um, in fact, my own first book was on a single site in China in, in Hunan mm -hmm. province, but, uh, and, you know, I, I remember facing this uh, kind of a challenge in the sense of how to uh, work on the kind of particular or very local site, but then also how do you uh, make a, a larger argument in terms of tying it into bigger issues and themes and, and important uh, 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 transformations in, in China or in your case, yeah, in the political history as well. So how did you um, think about this in terms of sort of methodologically the use of a single site as a focus of your research uh, in, in, and then linking that to larger historical claims. Was that a challenge? You know, this is a very good question. I should have asked myself years ago, but in, surprisingly, uh, I never ask. <laughs> um, yeah. I, at first, I thought I would uh, compare uh, three generations of a company town in China. Uh, one is the motor city, following mm -hmm. the Soviet model, uh, the number one motor city uh, uh, in the 1950s. And then Daqing is a, more like a unique uh, a Chinese model for company town. And then early 1980s, uh, a steel town uh, at the suburb of Shanghai uh, signaling uh, the opening up, reopening up of China in 1980s. Uh, but uh, as, as I mentioned, I, I when I collect the collection, uh, the research interviews uh, in Daqing got so rich, I, I decided to focus on one place only. Um, I think my dissertation committees, uh, they are fine with, they were fine with that. And <laughs> so they were questioned me, uh, but it, it is a, a good question. I think it, it, it will be a very good question for many scholars to ask when they are uh, uh, carrying on their, their research. Um, maybe first of all, I think as a planner, I, uh, I naturally, I always naturally link uh, local construction to a greater scale, a greater demand, you know, nationally and globally. Uh, it would be uh, even, it would be difficult for me now to link uh, everything happen uh, at the local level to a greater scale and uh, think of, uh, uh, you know, the larger claims, why, what is the larger uh, claim? Um, on the other hand, I think no, no other place like Daqing, this, uh, this close integration of a uh, state and a place, a place of this global and uh, local, this uh, blurring boundary be between public and private, if there is a, such a dichotomy uh, in Daqing, you know, uh, uh, in the 70s and also in the 60s. Uh, then I, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think uh, uh, this is more of a, I have a, my generation, many of us grew up in similar mining, uh, we call it mining uh, districts or factories, plants. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a birthmark of my generation and also my, my parents, uh, uh, these collective uh, memories. So this is uh, more like uh, uh, about a, a certain period, a time rather than a, a place. Mm. So I, I'm not saying these places are identical, but uh, this is definitely is a representative in a certain period of time. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I, I feel good enough. <laughs> I think that's, uh, of course, many researchers will have to make a decision if they want to focus on one place or multiple ones, which way will have to um, lead a better research in the end. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have that. Luckily, I didn't have that much struggling. I but I do have the struggling of uh, uh, which perspective should I focus on. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think both my strengths and weakness is uh, touching on many topics. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, in the end, I had a difficulty generalize, uh, generalize um, theories out of that. Then uh, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, maybe my contribution is to provide um, a rich and nuanced understanding of that period, that episode mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. texture. Uh, in the, uh, the reality and the real life, uh, maybe there's no theory can really summarize that. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, that's a, like a historian's excuse, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. No, I often, I, I, I can fully relate to that. I think one of the things I often tell my own students are, um, is that, uh, that people and places sometimes too are often far more complicated than the theories or that we mm -hmm. try to understand them with that um, they often defy the ability to bring them into one you know clear coherent sort of methodology or theory to look at them and I think that um, is a challenge right it seems like it should be so easy in some way you just have one site you should be able to uh, you know, to just tell that whole story, but it's it's much more complicated than you know, uh, uh, perhaps the comparative uh, model that you were going to initially do of three different sites. But um, so let's let's. I would love to. Uh, it was an interesting comment that you made about how it was uh, for somebody who's an urban planner who's primarily trained to analyze uh, space and and urbanization mm -hmm. and architecture and thing. I. I was really intrigued by your comment that it was um, as much about time. And so um, what do you think in terms of Chinese history, uh, what were some of the key factors that led to the conclusion that Daqing could serve as this kind of a model for the Chinese socialist uh, construction in uh, that moment? Um, uh, I think that's a really interesting story because it, it really does play an important role there. Um, so what led up to it being, do you think, becoming the kind of perfect place for that time, let's say? Yeah, um, I think that that thing, uh, they are, it emerged as a successful uh, industrial uh, model when China was deviating uh, from, the so from the Soviet ones. Uh, however, many scholars uh, argue uh, that uh, Chinese, uh, this is socialist uh, uh, China's strategy, uh, even after uh, it uh, broke up with uh, the USSR, kind of still similar to that of those. Mm. It claimed that the Soviet model, such as uh, mass mobilization, this high uh, moral uh, status uh, for, uh, for an incentive for working class, etc. I think for, uh, for the, uh, what Da Qing uh, brought uh, to uh, the PRC uh, is uh, more about, uh, yeah, the, my major, the special strategies. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, I call uh, in my book, uh, industrialization without urbanization. Uh, mm -hmm. This, uh, such as, uh, when I said urbanization, it means uh, urban housing, the provision of uh, urban housing, uh, public facilities, hospitals, um, and uh, schools. Um, the Daqing model, uh, when they build factories, they don't build uh, urban housing. They, uh, the workers uh, and the staff, they build their housing, rural-like uh, rural housing, uh, or uh, it's uh, sometimes I, I feel it's not really rural like housing. It's uh, it's more like a military camp. It's a mm. bar, but in uh, the form of uh, rural houses, uh, they build the house uh, for themselves. The voluntary, the so-called voluntary uh, building, and uh, they don't provide. And they have this remote, the dispersed pattern of uh, settlements. Um, so the the nineteen sixties. And the 1970s, uh, China witnessed the emergence, following the Dating model, uh, China witnessed the emergence of uh, numerous uh, this, uh, such uh, mining district and the factory complexes. Uh, uh, mm. They were statistically not in large enough or uh, not urban enough to be counted as cities. Uh, and their population uh, were engaged uh, more than just mining uh, or manufacturing, 
they uh, as the slogan uh, of the Dachin model called the integration of agriculture and uh, um, uh, industry, the integration of urban and rural, the integration of workers and peasants. Usually, it's the husband, husbands as the oil workers and the their wives, they call dependents, work as peasants. This combination mm. of uh, agriculture and the industry in one family is uh, something extraordinary with uh, Chinese characteristics. Just want to uh, also add that more the national level, this disperse the pattern of uh, development also uh, marked uh, the physical landscape throughout the, the country at the time accompanied by a quickly increasing national population. Uh, it grew uh, 300 million uh, in 15 uh, years. You can imagine the, the skill and, and with this extension of human inhabited uh, area greatly uh, during we call the culture uh, revolution. Industries mm -hmm. uh, were moving inland uh, originally along the coast uh, and the investment uh, that had been concentrated in the north uh, along, for example, the Russia border uh, diverted uh, to the south, to the southwest. Um, so the, uh, of course, this uh, Dati model, this decentralized model uh, was favored, not of uh, an invention of the ideology itself. It's also because the country, China, Face the threat of war at the time, uh, U.S., Malay, and uh, mm -hmm. the Soviet. Uh, so under this model, it would be really difficult uh, for the enemy uh, in the air uh, to distinguish urban from uh, rural areas and mm -hmm. uh, from industri industry, from agriculture center, from periphery. So I, I think that's the the key uh, factors and the, the unique. Uh, to make the Latin model uh, um, emerge at the time. So I, I would imagine that for a scholar like you who uh, was digging into the archives of this place, um, that you really, it seemed to me as a reader of the book that you begin with the site almost as a clean slate. There was really literally nothing there. Um, mm -hmm. You just had a, a a kind of an open plane, and then you had people doing some experimental digging, and then you could literally watch the the place grow into the massive site that it eventually became. Um, and I thought your book really captured that of just the struggles of how to uh, adapt to that uh, location and the nature of the soil and flooding and other issues, um, but also the the uh, really the building of the entire infrastructure had to come from, uh, everything was new. I mean, it, it had to be added to that place. There was, there was really no infrastructure there whatsoever, right? So, um, and you also seem to have had some really great archival images of uh, the development of that site too. So um, it felt like the reader was getting a, a kind of a snapshot over time of the, of the actual development of that uh, site along throughout history, throughout this period. Um, and it's tremendous, uh, quite rapid growth, it seemed to me. I don't know. But as a as a as somebody who studies urbanization and, and this kind of industrialization, um, was there anything dur in sort of in your um, tracking that development over time of nothing to this massive uh, infrastructure and a very successful place like Daqing that that really caught your eye as a historian or as a urban planner, just something, things that were interesting of how they managed that development. Um, I mean, and how much was it really, uh, you know, you talked a lot about kind of uh, sort of planning and, and the having a real master plan there, but was some of this derailed, so to speak, just to deal with the um, uh, things as they, troubles or challenges that they met along the way? Uh it is, um, yeah, it is um, uh, amazing. Uh, if you can uh, imagine if you were a planner born of that period uh, and uh, you were excited to build such a new city out of a blank uh, sheet. Um, but I, I would say many planners uh, in China, they got that opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. we, 
you know, built uh, hundreds of them nowadays. Uh, sometimes I am really jealous because what I produce um, uh, are papers. I, I'm, I'm not saying academic in life is not interesting, but we, what we producing are papers and the books, but uh, uh, my, my family classmates and the colleagues, they are producing cities. Uh, that's uh, uh, something, uh, uh, and uh, but this uh, Da Qing uh, uh, was uh, exceptional uh, in a way that uh, at the time uh, the planners and the architects they were denounced uh, that they sh uh, because the, in the fifties uh, what they were building. Uh, the, Receive lots of criticism. Uh, said they strictly uh, or rigidly following the Soviet model, uh, and also uh, secretly, probably uh, their uh, knowledge learned from the capitalist world. So mm. uh, they are um, not fit in the Chinese uh, context, not fit in Chinese uh, situation. Uh, they receive the criticism. They uh, have to. Uh, they, they were sent to the countryside and sent to the construction sites and uh, factories to live and to work uh, with uh, uh, workers and the local peasants. That's uh, how, uh, you know, what uh, Daqing planners and architects, the, the designers, they, they did. Uh, they indeed, uh, they lived and, and, and they uh, work uh, with uh, local peasants. Uh, they, they learn from their local tech construction uh, uh, technology, if we can mm -hmm. see that. It's a, like a, more like a vernacular uh, building uh, knowledge. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's also amazing uh, uh, because um, such, uh, it, they have uh, hundreds of thousands of people. They need to accommodate that amount of people uh, in a few months before, uh, you know, in, in a year, Daqing, was required uh, to put into production within the same year of its discovery in 1959. Mm -hmm. It was the most difficult time, the famine, famine year, during the famine years, uh, both the um, materials for construction and even the food were scarce. I think, uh, yeah, they were struggling uh, to accomplish uh, that, uh, uh, not with not without sacrifices and mm -hmm. without a, a tremendous loss, but, but they did uh, 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 go through that process. And in the end, uh, to put uh, that in oil field into production, uh, uh, functional with, uh, of course, the railway uh, built by the Russian and the Japanese uh, was already there, but they built a uh, Rows a bit to do the houses and they build factories and mm -hmm. uh, within three or five years and then in uh, 1964 uh, China already claimed its uh, independent uh, uh, of uh, oil supply uh, before it's heavily um, dependent on the Soviet Union to be the, mm -hmm. the Oil, uh, energy supply. Yeah. I want I'll come back to that in just a minute because I think that part of the story is really interesting as well. But um, one other question just about the uh, kind of local architectural style. I'm sort of really fascinated with that because it seemed to me, and I'm, uh, is this the um, what you refer to as the Gandale style? Is that the, the vernacular architecture of that region? Is that correct? Okay. Yes. And so then you have what really fascinated me though is that you have. Uh, all of these workers that are coming in from all over China, from uh, it seems literally everywhere, that have to then kind of adapt to this, first of all, a, a rather um, challenging environment for them if they're from the South, uh, quite cold and uh, inhospitable, different foods for them and all of that. Um, yet then they're also trying to live in a, a different type of a structure then too. So um but they seem to have tried to keep uh, some kind of a local architectural style, at least initially, it seems, right, to build that up. So could you say a little just more about that, um, uh, that kind of vernacular architecture and some of the challenges it presented for those coming in from other parts of China, perhaps? I think the Gan, uh, Gandale uh, 
Cantale is not an invention uh, by, uh, it's not a modern uh, invention by architect. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a product of learning uh, from uh, local. Uh, the word itself uh, means, uh, uh, means uh, uh, like a, it, it's the construction, a way of a construction. Uh, you put pounded uh, mud bricks uh, with straws and uh, but the uh, Da Qing uh, Gandale, the mud, uh, mud huts, they, they also have uh, some uh, renovation, innovation in structures, improved uh, internal uh, ventilations. Uh, they, uh, the, the Gandale was uh, adopted because it most of because the economy of uh, housing construction. They also push this economy of uh, housing provision to an extreme, as I, I mentioned, but it's also a uh, practical measures uh, because within a year in the scarcity of construction materials, uh, you know, the winter in Daqing in the Northeast uh, was pretty harsh at, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the oil, the Ministry of uh, Petroleum Industry uh, they couldn't afford uh, to stop working, stop uh, a build, building uh, during the winter. They won't accomplish uh, the mission of uh, oil production in a year. So mm -hmm. uh, they pick this. Um, uh, they pick this uh, strategy. Uh, this uh, and also a, a ask uh, oil or touching uh, people to use their spare time to build their own. Uh, uh, houses. Um, so, uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, also represented this spirit of austerity and the thrifty. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, the, on the other hand, the egalitarianism between urban and the rural that uh, uh, industrial workers uh, is not. Uh, uh, nowadays, we're seeing um, they are in uh, 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 like a thrifty situation, but in the end, they still uh, enjoy a certain privilege over peasants. So uh, this is like an egalitarianism, uh, a symbolic egalitarianism between uh, urban and rural workers and, and the peasants. So the uh, Agandale village would very much look like the other village um, uh, in the Northeast, only it's more orderly <laughs> arranged, um, mm -hmm. And uh, I totally identical, like uh, mm -hmm. all uh, like uh, the Dati oil field uh, is huge, but on the land there's only one type of uh, housing. Uh, and this is a uh, uh, both uh, both a symbolic and also uh, I think astonishing. Yeah. Yeah. How much of that survives today? Of any of those types of structures, is it? Is there vestiges of it? Um, not much, indeed. I don't know if there is any uh, really then, <laughs> because wow. uh, it made of uh, mud. Uh, it need uh, it needs high maintenance. Uh, when I uh, mm -hmm. visited the the site, um, it was uh, oh, uh, so more than ten years ago. Uh, uh, I I tried. Uh, uh, in the end, I only found one uh, like intact gandale inside wow. uh, a Qing Design Institute, where they uh, you know they have the knowledge and mm. the willingness to maintain that uh, uh, mud house. Uh, but the others, uh, those formerly uh, gandale villages, is more like uh, uh, there will be some add-on uh, renovation, and they fill with uh, bricks. So. It's, like a not oh, not a Gandali house anymore. Mm. Uh, it, when it's designed, um, it's called a scientific uh, Gandali. And the, <laughs> that the, the the oil leaders they they claimed uh, this scientific Gandali uh, should uh, last for more than fifty years, uh, but none of these uh, realized. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was wondering it's, if it would ever, you see in other parts of the world, right, that often after modernization and industrial mm -hmm. or urbanization and all of that, then sometimes mm -hmm. you get a reversion to a kind of nostalgia for the lost uh, uh, vernacular styles and things. And would there ever be a, you see, I think in other parts of China too, say in the Southwest and other places, a kind of 
romanticizing of that pre-industrialized yeah. uh, version and, and even an attempt to try to preserve or recreate it, often, you know, a new production, but trying to go back to that style. But uh, um, I don't know if it yeah. matter if it would ever happen. But. Yeah, I think the, the ironic part of uh, Gandale is uh, it is a temporary measures for this crisis moment. But mm -hmm. then it, it was mandated uh, as a permanent uh, uh, solution uh, to, uh, to all factories and the plants. But it's not a permanent solution at all. So mm -hmm. however uh, the political situation uh, enforced and uh, in the end, like it, it didn't last. Yeah. Yeah, I think we see that in other parts of the world too, right? Or even along the American South where what are emergency structures that are put up that then they become almost naturalized and, and never get changed actually and just persist uh, um, and become somewhat permanent then even uh, or semi-permanent at least for a much longer period of time than they were meant to be. So um, I would love to shift to over uh, to the oil side of things too, because that's a whole uh, different story. Um, which I, uh, you alluded to a little bit, um, just in terms of, I mean, I think, again, as, a, as somebody who's not, um, you know, uh, a specialist of, say, industrialization or even um, of, of this kind of material, I, at least from what I know about it, the oil discovery and oil production or technology is a very expensive uh, um, industry to, um, to get into and, and also quite uh, difficult technologically. And I can imagine in the 1950s too, this was uh, something that really required a very uh, intensive amount of uh, both capital, that is to say financing, but also uh, technological skill. And so how did that um, take off in China? Where were they drawing mainly from for expertise? And also uh, who was funding this, I guess? Where was the capital coming from? I mean, clearly there was a lot of human labor that, that drove a lot of this, but um, uh, how did how did this take off just in terms of, of making it happen technologically and, and financially? Yeah, indeed, uh, I think there's a, a great demand uh, for advanced technology and the finance um, uh, determining uh, uh, the timing and the way that that thing was developed uh, and uh, constructed um, uh, critically. Uh, it, for a long time, uh, people suspected that there should be oil in, uh, in that area, in the Northeast, uh, even during, uh, during the uh, Manchukuo period, the, the Japanese uh, puppet state. Indeed, they, uh, they employed American geologists to deploy, the, the, to explore uh, the area, but discovered uh, nothing. Um, I, I didn't see it in my book, but everyone would assume if they did in the 1930s or 19, 1940s, it's right in the center of that uh, Manchukuo, uh, the, the, the Northeast, the, the Manchuria region. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the outcome of the Second World War may have changed. Yeah. They discovered the largest oil deposit uh, uh, in mainland China. Uh, it was the technology, uh, I think, uh, in my perspective, uh, to prohibit it, they discover uh, oil at the time because the, the oil deposit hit really deep and in a mm -hmm. tricky certificate uh, structure. It was a the advancement of technology in the uh, 1950s to help, and the 60s to help discover the oil uh, in Daqing with the great assistance uh, by the Soviet Union, by the experts uh, from the Soviet Union. Of course, financially and technologically. Uh, if you look at the history of oil uh, in uh, Russia, they also discovered a huge oil field at the time in 1960s uh, because this advance, uh, advancement of uh, technology. But interestingly, um, uh, da Qing, the discovery of, uh, of Da Qing uh, in 1959. Uh, offered China uh, somewhat the freedom to break up with the Soviet Union. You know, right. the Soviet Union, yeah, helped China to, to discover, uh, of course, with the, 
uh, generous efforts of uh, Chinese uh, geologists is always this this political correctness and, uh, the, mm. regarding the discovery of oil. But uh, you know, generations efforts, generations efforts, and uh, many collaborations uh, between Chinese geologists and uh, the American one, formerly before 1949, then the, the Soviet ones. Um, but they, they got to discover that. Um, uh, in the middle of Chinese, this deviation from the, the Soviet past uh, really contributed uh, to, uh, you know, uh, like uh, when it was when China gained its oil dependency, that uh, that Mao uh, began to publicly criticizing uh, the Soviet Communist Party and its leadership, and and also uh, I think it shaped uh, the international relationship of uh, the People's Republic of China at the time, uh, that's uh, for sure. And also mm. this um, uh, continuing uh, demand for more oil uh, uh, production uh, uh, continued in the 1960s with, again, uh, in the 1960s with this dramatic increase of crude oil production, China already ranked uh, the eighth uh, in the world. And even, I also mentioned in my book, it surprised me, uh, I, I saw a report uh, written by George Bush uh, at the time who worked uh, in the Beijing office. Yeah. Yeah, he, 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 uh, wrote, uh, he reminded Washington that may look China as a possible source of oil considering you know, the, this trend. Um, it uh, this uh, because at the time uh, this discovery of oil has gone uh, to the offshore oil exploration, so it further pushed the ministry uh, uh, of uh, petroleum industry to open um, to to reconnect with the West instead of uh, uh, the, the Soviet Union. Uh, so mm -hmm. the the first um, joint venture agreements uh, signed indeed. Uh, uh, or with American oil companies to survey, to explore, and to develop China's offshore potentials, which mm. involves many conflicts today. Yes, yeah. Yeah, long, it has long-lasting effects, yeah. Yeah, but it is an interesting little sub-story there to have, uh, you know, George Bush in China at that time yeah. talking about the potential as an oil man coming from Texas himself, right? So he yes. uh, yeah, clearly... Was probably already looking out over that those terrains and, and imagining things. So, yeah. so then things, yeah. So things shifted offshore after that into the. Is it in the area of Bohai in that area, just off of uh, off the yeah. coast there? Is at that, at yeah. first, uh, yeah. At first, is uh, oh, um, it's beyond the Bohai Bay. Mm -hmm. Is this um, debatable, uh, arguable? This boundary between China and the Japan, right? And uh, in the end, uh, Deng Xiaoping said uh, we drop this uh, boundary issues. We would uh, develop the area, explore the area together. Mm. Great. So that um, it is interesting, just how this. I mean, we were discussing a little bit ago how uh, this one place kind of tells a story of of China and Chinese modernization and ties into that, but it's also uh, I find it fascinating just how much it's also tied into kind of global history as well and, and global uh, 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 development of, of oil um, throughout uh, other parts of the world as well and where China fit into that story and is connected to uh, the uh, transference of technology and specialists who are moving around and actually making that happen. Um, for the last little part uh, of our discussion, I would love to um, completely shift to a different vantage point that really surprised me in the book. Um, uh, really, uh, not only surprised me, but it pleasantly surprised me too. It, I thought it added a completely different um, vantage point than say the archival material or all of the other fascinating documents that you're working with and planning materials and all of that. And this is, uh, the the way that you wove in the story of this place with uh, the oral account of this female planner by the name of Jia Binhua. And I would love for you to tell her story a little bit. And, and uh, first of all, 
how you came across this, uh, the material related to her, um, and say a little bit more about this, what struck me as a truly exceptional woman and how uh, you eventually decided to, that it would, you, that you should tell her story along with the telling of the story of Dotching and its development as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for asking uh, that question. I think um, uh, this is like uh, the gift uh, why you are on the way of doing research. Uh, uh, one of the most rewarding part of uh, doing research that uh, you will meet people, you will make a connection to them. Uh, some of them are surprisingly uh, friendly and open. They open their doors to let you in. They uh, they tell your story candidly and they, they touch you uh, sometimes uh, surprisingly, pleasant, uh, surprisingly. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I found uh, uh, Zha Binghua uh, through uh, Tong Ji's alumni work because I, she, uh, uh, as a female uh, planner, uh, represented Da Qing designers to, to make a speech on the national conference. From the speech, I can clearly tell she's from Tongji University. Uh, mm -hmm. She received uh, her education in Shanghai. So I, I, I traced uh, her down through uh, Tongji's alumni uh, network. I still remember the day vividly. I drove uh, all the way from Shanghai to Nanjing to meet her uh, for the first time. Uh, we talked uh, like nonstop for eight uh, or 10 hours until it was oh my really gosh. dark. Yeah. Uh, I, I felt uh, connected to her instantly. I, I've interviewed many first generation uh, Da Qing uh, people. Many of them, they all, they, many of them, they, they all have fascinating stories. You know, party cadres uh, who look really rigid and straight and suddenly talk about the story of his romance uh, with an iron girl and have mm -hmm. the hardship of uh, he raising the, uh, the children alone because uh, the iron girl later died of uh, accident, et cetera, et cetera. I think I ran into many interesting and fascinating uh, people but this is the one I really feel uh, connected. I think partly uh, because uh, um, we share very similar background. We, we are all female professional uh, struggling between uh, our career and uh, the family raising children. Uh, I still remember uh, her regret not taking care of her children nicely mm. at the time. I have to, uh, I have to leave uh, my daughter uh, with my parents so I can finish my dissertation. So we sort of, we indeed, we cried together <laughs> like mm -hmm. during, during the talk. Um, uh, uh, but also uh, I think they, I, I felt this personality and also they, they loved, uh, uh, they, they have very, I found uh, interesting, they have really good memory or, for what have happened in Da Qing, unlike the other people with lots of rich details. But, it, uh, but Zha Binghua, uh, Hua, uh, she didn't tell me uh, she kept uh, her diary at first uh, we met. It, like we built up this friendship over the years. It was until, let's say, five years later, uh, when mm. I thought, uh, when I, uh, before even I decided to revise my dissertation into a book, before I, you know, uh, he suddenly told me, he sent me a copy of a diary, said, oh, I, mm. I kept it all these years. And um, yeah, I digitalized it. <laughs> he, she even digitalized that. So wow. she sent me a copy. Yeah, I'm like, wow. So when the, the first time I saw that, I, I realized I really should put uh, that part into, like, like, like you said, weaving into the uh, ground narrative of that story. I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it, her contribution really made this book so much better that the unique feature of yeah, my contribution and her contribution as well. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're, I, th I mean, the connections are just uh, amazing actually, because she was also uh, an affiliate uh, of Tongji University as well. So you have that and then um, yeah. And I know you're part of the Women uh, Women Planner Society, and so uh, you know I think this the connection of her as a as a, a woman who was sent up there um, 
uh, I mean, I found the story of the back and forth, the relationship between her and her uh, future husband. And then uh, after they're married and all of that, the challenges that they had of being kind of on different parts of the site and having to try to see each other and all of that. It gave such a human face to the challenges that they each where she, you know, she almost, there were times when she felt uh, that um, she had to put her job above even visiting her, at the time, boyfriend, I guess, before they were married and and had to show that she was willing to work late into the night, but then she would miss the train going to the town where, where he was. And it would just, uh, you, you really gave a, a kind of a personal sense there. Um, did, did it also, I mean, I think, given your position too, and, and focus on women planners and things too, that um, it also seemed to uh, to tell a story about a kind of gender dynamics at the site that probably would have been not possible to tell with the other resources available, I would imagine. Um, could you say a little bit of something about that? Uh, I, I found that side of it also uh, quite fascinating. Yeah, um, I think uh, Hua is pretty uh, representative uh, in that sense. Uh, first of all, uh, six, almost like 60% of uh, Daxing's population uh, were young intellectuals. Uh, she's one of them. And uh, as a female, uh, uh, I would say uh, if a uh, female is better represented, uh, represented uh, in oil industry uh, and in hmm. planning profession as well. We have this women's planners society. We have pretty close uh, relationship. Uh, uh, now, uh, probably uh, women's planners, uh, women planners is uh, more than half. Uh, we are majority now, uh, but wow. that's uh, a girl beyond the uh, the dating story. Uh, and, uh, but I did you it, say that they're also um, uh, overly uh, represented in the oil uh, industry as well for oil better, planning? Or? Better, uh, not overly. It's like yeah, better but, represented in oil than the other heavy industrial at wow, the time. Wow, that's, that's yeah. fascinating, actually. I, I wonder, I mean, I, I don't know uh, the statistics for, say, the Texas oil industry or something, but I would... I would mm -hmm my prediction would be that women would not be very well represented in, in those <laughs> industries traditionally. So that's fascinating. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. Yeah. With your... yeah because oil, uh, oil industry is less, um, some, uh, some sectors uh, are less labor intensive, uh, which fit for, for, for women. Also, mm. uh, Da Qing, uh, they invented uh, this, um, uh, uh, this uh, title called Iron Girls, uh, mm. because the, the most well-known uh, model workers uh, were uh, Iron Men. So they, uh, Da Qing also have these Iron Girls uh, mm. who, uh, who try to uh, you know, uh, be the equivalent part of this labor force. Uh, this is uh, the symbol of women emancipation uh, at the time in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, uh, Bing Hua, Hua, as a, a college graduate, uh, she's a, a, an elite, uh, that's absolutely sure. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think she also, uh, she was uh, ambitious and uh, she uh, almost at the time she, uh, was put in the center of this Daqing propaganda. But mm -hmm. she changed. I think uh, the interesting uh, why uh, I put her into the story is that she changed um, uh, her belief in the Daqing model when she began to have a family, when she began to have children. And uh, she's no longer uh, such a revolutionary anymore because the, the daily life is so demanding. And uh, the Da Qing model, this decentralized model, uh, they don't provide um, uh, urban amenities. This distance between hospitals and schools uh, and uh, the villages uh, they live in uh, offered uh, many hardship for a woman uh, to maintain like a, both a professional life and a, a person, their personal life. I think that's mm -hmm. uh, the fascinating still part of that. It's uh, not very friendly for, for women to work uh, 
and have a family at, at the same time, which also totally changed her perspective on uh, this uh, dating uh, model. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, maybe we haven't come so far from that uh, even today. Still, that <laughs> needs a lot, quite a lot of improvement there. Particularly when we think about the types of forfeitures and, and of time and, and uh, sacrifices and, and hard decisions about things with family and children and things. But I, I felt she remained so human uh, and humane even in her um, I, the the story of them when they after they were married and, and moved into the new house and the husband began to adapt the structure in certain ways. Um, but then they took in uh, uh, um, the other family to give them a place to live that she felt sorry for them and their accommodation wasn't really up, up, you know, up to the same, you know, to the level that she thought they sh should have. And, and I thought that was such a compassionate kind of glimpse of even in very hard times uh, to still um, hold that spirit of trying to help everybody there, you know, the ones that they could and, and bring them in. So it was a very touching part of the book, I thought, actually. Uh, yeah, I think the, yeah, her, her, her diary touched me not only because it offered rich historic details of everyday life in Da Qing, but also uh, I think revealing is that uh, this spirit I won't call it the dating spirit, but this is the spirit of stubbornness and the resiliency mm. and this belief uh, in romance and hope, even uh, during the most difficult time. Uh, I think that's the birthmark of their generation, my parents' generation, and also mm -hmm. hopefully can be inherited by, by us, the contemporaries. I think that's uh, one important reason I really like uh, to, uh, to, to put her story into the book. I also I pick uh, her pictures carefully. Uh, I, I still remember I, I pick a picture of her laughing out loud at, mm. after she recovered from hospital nearly death. Uh, 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 she uh, offered me uh, another picture of looking really like a peasant woman, like a, a, like a skinny and... Uh, tortured by life. I said, oh, I, I really like the other one, the, the laughing one, you know, mm. <laughs> after, you know, after this hardship, she can always love. Uh, 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 like, uh, I really uh, like, uh, like her uh, in that way. Yeah, this yeah. resiliency, yeah. That's really, that's a, that's a great, I think, uh, uh, story that captures the feeling even that the reader gets from the way that you depict her kind of personality and her transformation actually over time. And um, I think it's a, a wonderful place to maybe even tie up our uh, discussion here as well, because uh, for me, when I first began reading the book and, I'll, and first seeing the title, but then also began, I thought, oh, this is going to be a story about oil drilling machines and, you know, uh, uh, very uh, industrialized, uh, hardcore uh, metal and oil and dirty and, and scraping and all of this kind of stuff. And, and in the end, uh, it's really as much a story about, um, about people as much as and, and quite uh, uh, emotional, even portraits of, of people um, within that uh, space. And in your earlier comments about how it's, uh, more than just a story about a particular location or an urban place or an industrial place, but actually about a moment in time and say the development of something over time, I think really captures it in the, in the, the, uh, the rest of the title, the formation of the Chinese socialist, uh, uh, socialist state um, really captures, I think, that uh, sort of coming to be of a new generation, if you will. And I think you were, you've been using that kind of terminology, right, about how it does, it tells us that story of that, uh, that generation. And, um, I imagine, uh, maybe just as a kind of final question, though, too, is, um, do you, I mean, is this history uh, still something that, say, young people growing up in China would be uh, aware of? I mean, you had to find it and, and, and tell this story. Um, how, you know, do you think, say, uh, young people in China today, how much would they be able to relate to the kind of story that you told in, in your book? Yeah, um, I think that's the, uh, that's why I, I wrote the book. I, I really uh, like uh, 
the younger generation to know that part of the history. Uh, it's not saying uh, it's not well recorded. Uh, it is more of a propaganda. It's widely mm -hmm. publicized at the time, and it's still from time to, from time to time people will talk about that. that. But uh, uh, there, uh, when I uh, when I started, is as aim to indeed uh, fill in a blank spot uh, that to that uh, such an important episode of uh, history in 20th century, let's say 20th century uh, China, maybe also mm -hmm. the 20th century um, uh, as itself. Um, there's no uh, similar piece of work uh, to truly document it and also try to make a connection from the past to the present. Uh, so uh, I think that's uh, truly the purpose of uh, my doing that research and uh, uh, publish that uh, book. Um, uh, indeed, uh, I, I, I gave uh, a talk uh, over another um, uh, media uh, mm -hmm. in the spring. Uh, it, it received uh, thousands of uh, audience. I was so surprised and I really happy that uh, it, the, the young uh, generation, the younger generation nowadays, um, they are interested in that part. They uh, they felt touched. I think they mostly felt touched by Zha Binghua, their, the Hua's story, the couple mm. and their residency, uh, their humanities, you know, that yeah. lasts lo much longer than history, than a certain episode um, of its time. Uh, that we all should learn how um, we should uh, do facing the hardship, facing dramatic turns, even crisis moment globally and uh, locally. Maybe that's something we should oh, we should be prepared for the coming years. Mm -hmm. No, I, I that's that's a, a great way to put it because that that's what really. Uh, caught my eye and also I think what made me uh, unable to put the book down was the the way that her story helped to drive the other narrative and it had a nice uh, back and forth between that real uh, kind of grittiness of an oil field but then the real grit of a person who's trying to to work through that and and also create a kind of a life out of that uh, maintain a sort of beauty and a and a joy and a, um, a, a pride for the work that that she and her husband were doing. And, and that was, uh, I think for me, um, as much as I enjoyed learning about the kind of uh, uh, development of, of oil technology and all of that as a historian or somebody interested in, in that kind of material uh, cultural side of things, um, it was really, there's, uh, it's almost like uh, really two books in one where you get this other glimpse of a, um, say you have the urban planner side of you looking at one of it, but you almost have a sort of, anthropologist, ethnographer, sociologist sort of eye as well that uh, was really telling another story at the same time. So, so thank you very much for, um, uh, for talking with me today, but also for um, writing such a, a wonderful book that um, I think uh, is, is very significant in, in capturing uh, uh, something quite important in the history of, of 20th century uh, China and its development, and also just capturing a little bit of uh, of the interesting lives uh, of the people that were that were living through that moment as well. Um, it was a it was a really enjoyable and and fascinating uh, book to read. Um, so thank you again for for spending the time with me today, Professor Holy. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for the invitation and for all the questions and the conversations. I I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm.